Hello, may I just have your attentions for a few minutes? Good evening and welcome to House of Sweden. My name is Jonas Hofström and I'm the Swedish ambassador to the United States. And the embassy is a proud, proud to co-host tonight's event with the New American Foundation. In the early 1990s, our Minister for Foreign Affairs, Carl Bildt, was Sweden's Prime Minister. Mr. Bildt sent an email to then President, President Bill Clinton. That was the first email ever between two heads of government. <laughs> Carl Bildt's interest in IT has only increased over the years, and today he is a devoted blogger and tweeter. Nowadays, I don't have to wait for the diplomatic pouch to arrive at Dallas airport to know what's on the minister's mind. I just need to read his daily blog. Internet freedom is at the top of Sweden's foreign policy agenda. Our policy is quite straightforward. Human rights should apply online as well as offline. As freedom of expression applies to the internet, and the internet has become a fundamental instrument for people to express themselves, we must increase our efforts to keep the internet free from censorship and surveillance. The US government is one of our closest partners, and our joint efforts have gotten internet freedom on the agenda of the United Nations Human Rights Council. Both our governments provide support to dissidents and activists in need of targeted support. Governments play an important role here, of course, but so do corporations. There is a growing understanding that service providers and online companies have to protect free speech online. An important part of our work is therefore to urge corporations to agree on common standards that won't violate human rights. To apply human rights online does not mean that we need new human rights. On the contrary, we just need to, streng to strengthen those rights that we already have. Rebecca McKinnon is one of the world's leading experts in this field and my government has often relied on her advice. Rebecca was already involved in the issue two years ago when she attended the very first Internet Freedom Expert Meeting in Stockholm, and we look forward to continued cooperation with you, Rebecca. Rebecca's excellent new book, Consent of the Networked, shines a light on every entity, governments, corporations, civil society, and individuals that have both a stake in and a responsibility for protecting rights in a networked world. Congratulations, Rebecca. Let me introduce tonight's moderator, Steve Cole. Steve is president of New America Foundation and a Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist. The embassy is very grateful to him for inviting us to co-host tonight's event. Steve, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, Ambassador, uh, thank you so much for such a gracious introduction and for your hospitality and the gulf of uh, distance between ourselves and you. <laughs> Seems like it should be closed. Please come forward, oh people. <laughs> and uh, bring your drinks and your uh, conviviality. Uh, all right, uh, well, we're um, going to talk just for a little while and take some questions from you and uh, then let you get back to your conversation and the, and the food and drink. And we're very pleased to be in partnership with the embassy here. Sweden is, uh, as the ambassador said, one of uh, the most important uh, governments in the world right now in both thinking about the peculiar problems of freedom and uh, privacy in the online public square, and also as a convener, a uh, credible convener of complicated conversations across governments and between governments and citizens and governments and corporations. So uh, this is really the ideal place for this conversation. Rebecca and I will talk for about 20 or 25 minutes, and then, as I say, we'll take a few questions from you, and we'll go forward from there. Um, I will avoid the Charlie Rose question, which is, 
why did you write this book? <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me ask a slightly different version of that question, which is, you know, you, as the ambassador said, you've been working in this space long before it became uh, so prominent. And you have, in this important uh, survey, described a public square that in many ways resembles the public squares that we've all been uh, wrestling over politically in, in the world for a few centuries now, uh, but in other ways is really quite different from public spaces that we're used to visualizing in Tahrir Square or elsewhere. And because of the role of private uh, actors in this virtual public space. So in describing your ambitions in this book, will you say something uh, to get us started about why you think this public space, this political space, is different from the physical spaces where mm -hmm. protesters have assembled and shouted at kings and that sort of thing for a long sure. time. Sure, absolutely. Before I answer your question, I just want to echo a few thanks yeah. that you sure. gave um, both uh, to the ambassador, to the Swedish embassy for your for gen generous hosting, uh, and to the New America Foundation, without which this book would not have been completed oh, wow. nearly as quickly <laughs> or as well. <laughs> Uh, and to the many people in the room who have provided a lot of support and inspiration, there, there are quite, quite a number of you here, um, a few family members, um, Bennett Freeman, my partner in crime, who has read many different drafts and uh, without whose uh, editorial skills it wouldn't have been as good either. And so I just want to make sure I get those thanks. Well uh, before I actually answer your question. <laughs> That's right. Give you um, some time to think about it, too. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, well, a absolutely. I mean, we, we're now in a situation in most modern societies where, um, as citizens, uh, we are relying on digital platforms and services and devices uh, to conduct not only our personal affairs and our business, but also increasingly our politics and our political discourse and, and to be informed. But these spaces are owned, operated, and created by the private sector for the most part. And there are standards that are common and, and that, that are unlicensed and, and so on um, and shared, but, but primarily this is a, a privately owned and operated space. So it's, it's kind of like the public sphere has gone into a shopping mall. Um, and you have sort of a new type of overlapping sovereignty that I, I sort of talk about, where uh, you have internet companies in, in which people are congregating uh, from all over the world uh, and using these spaces to challenge the sovereignty of physical governments sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, physical governments trying to exercise power, of course, over these companies as well uh, in ways that sometimes influences people far outside the constituency of those governments. Uh, and, and you also have, have a situation where the companies themselves are exercising a sort of governance function over the people using the services and acting, you know, we would hope as benign sovereigns, but the, their level of, of accountability and concern for the, the civil rights and, and political rights of the people using their services varies tremendously from some to zero. <laughs> well, and, and, and this is such an important set of insights in the book, but I remember when we were first uh, fortunate enough to be luring you to New America, you were thinking about that proposition um, in reference to other social responsibility mm -hmm. movements and, and corporate responsibility movements that had preceded this uh, set of dilemmas around the internet. And for example, movements to prevent uh, shoe companies from using child labor, making basketball shoes, or uh, from shooting protesters while extracting minerals from the ground and so forth, and that you were going to try to develop insights that would create an analogous movement of citizen mm -hmm. consciousness and rights and also corporate uh, standards that would improve this. And so my question is, how far are we along on that trail? And what are the obstacles? Well, we're probably pre-1970 Earth Day. <laughs> 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 to, to, to make an analogy that I think people are just beginning to be aware that, uh, that, that companies 
internet companies, technology companies have a responsibility to free expression and privacy and that they need to be pushed. Uh, and companies, I think some of the more enlightened ones, are, are starting to recognize that they can actually deliver value um, by showing that they care about these things more than perhaps their competitors do. Um, but it's very early days, and I think the movement, you know, what we might call the nascent internet freedom movement or, or something like that, certainly got a big push just in the past few weeks with the protests online against the protect <coughs> online pri uh, piracy, uh, I mean, the stop online, pri but I can never yes. say this ac acronym, SOPA, Stop Online right. Piracy Act, um, and uh, the accompanying Senate bill that um, internet companies and internet users kind of banded together to, to protest against. And, and I think that we've seen kind of an awakening among a lot of internet users that people need to get more engaged in the politics um, and, and also pay more attention both to what governments and companies are doing. Well, so since you just ripped the subject from the headlines, uh, mm. let me ask a question that I had further down my list, but I'm curious about as someone who's a couple degrees removed from the front lines of that movement but follows it, the very fact that corporations are competing with each other to control this space gives rise to the doubt that and spontaneous online grassroots reaction like the one that knocked SOPA off mm -hmm. uh, of, of its track could be possibly polluted by the same corporate competition that has shaped so much of the rest of the web. And I, I guess my question is, how do you uh, evaluate the sort of authenticity of grassroots mm -hmm. resistance to piracy legislation, uh, the pressure on privacy legislation in Europe that's underway now, mm -hmm. uh, does it feel um, that it can retain its independence from other kinds of corporate interests? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think a lot of activism ends up being strategic. And, and so the, I, I think the different cases end up being quite different. And I think with the anti-SOPA um, movement, you saw a convergence of interests between the civil liberties and human rights, free expression, and grassroots internet user activism side, and a certain segment of internet companies that had commercial reasons for wanting to oppose SOPA. Um, and, you know, the free expression reasons kind of overlapped, whereas in other policy issues, say for instance privacy regulation. You have citizens groups and companies and governments in, in very different configuration. You might have citizens groups uh, with governments against the companies in, in, in I think in Europe much more. Mm -hmm. And so depending on the issue, I, I think um, the alignments are different. You, know, you sometimes have citizens calling on governments to curb ex excesses by companies and sometimes you have citizens strategizing with certain companies to curb what they feel are excesses or unrepresentative um, behavior or laws by parts of government and other parts of industry. So, so it does move around. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, so it's, it's kind of hard to answer the question of, you know, does, does activism need to be pure in order to be legitimate? Well, I guess, I think can it retain, of, is, can it, yeah. to what degree is that agenda mm -hmm. an independent and grassroots agenda right. over time, I guess, is the yeah. version of my question. Well, that's, that's what we'll have to see, yeah. I, I think, you know, I mean, certainly. And, and to go back to your sort yeah. of very striking, we're pre-Earth Day 1970, mm -hmm. uh, if we were to reach I don't know, the Al Gore campaign of, uh, or the earth in the balance phase of all of this consciousness and communication about rights and about expectations, both by customers and by citizens, what would be the signs of change in the mm -hmm. conduct of either governments or corporations that would, to you, mm -hmm. mark that, that progress? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think a number of things. I think you'd see an across-the-board commitment, at least by democratic governments, that legislation dealing with the Internet, whatever problem it's trying to solve, would seek to ensure that it is human rights and civil liberties compatible, that, that, that there'd be a commitment to core free expression and privacy principles in pursuing 
whatever problems and solutions with the internet, um, and, and a commitment by democratic countries not to pursue trade agreements and, and other multilateral arrangements that end up hurting um, free expression and privacy. Mm -hmm. So that's on the government side. I think on the, co on the company side, um, you'd want to see companies sort of saying with pride, we believe in free expression and privacy. We believe in protecting the rights of our users. And this is part of our value, um, rather than kind of being afraid to use the, the, the term human rights. Um, and really agreeing um, to recognizing that they, they need to be held accountable. I mean, as we've seen in other sectors, and there's some people here in the room who've worked on um, initiatives in other sectors with, say, you know, manufacturing or the extractive sector, that for quite some time now, companies in the, in the mining and, and extractive sector have signed on to agreements where they agree that they are going to work with civil society and with socially responsible investors and, and some governments to avoid you know, collateral human rights abuses as a result of their business. And you, you have manufacturers also you know, for a long time recognizing they can't go it alone. They actually need to make, not only make commitments, but you know, have external uh, communities be able to evaluate and confirm that they're really living up to their commitments and other industries have been willing to do this and um, so far very few internet and com telecommunications companies have have recognized that they need to do this if they want to maintain public trust over the r long run I, I think they're more are coming to realize this uh, and, and I think that that's, that's so, so we need to see that. And then on the citizen side, I, I think um, we will see more of a coming of age when people are really making voting decisions and really pushing their policy makers on internet related issues, which is only just starting to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also really organizing to get the companies that whose services and products they use to change things they don't like. And, and it's possible to do a lot more of that, I think. And so, of course, I'm not sure everyone here knows that one of the reasons that you've been, been such a thought leader in this space and, and arrived in it so early was because of the, of the assignment that you undertook as a CNN correspondent in China, and you were sort of present as a, as a Mandarin speaker in the beginning of the migration of Chinese descent online and the formation of the contest that we now all know about between the Chinese state and, and those of its citizens who, who speak online. And I wondered if you could just, there's some um, quite striking uh, anecdotes and voices that you bring into the book um, to crystallize these universal issues. But before I read one of them, uh, why don't you just talk a little bit about how your correspondence in China led you into mm -hmm. this passion, into this space? Yeah. Well, I was in China working for CNN when the internet arrived in China commercially in 1995. And um, as Western journalists at that time, we were very excited because it was a way for people to communicate in, in a manner that seemed like the, the government could not control. Um, but. So I began to cover stories about them. But of course, as a journalist, began to use the internet to get information out more quickly than, than I'd been able to before. Um, but then the government, of course, started blocking websites. And so I started experiencing and observing how the government was moving to try and control and surveil the space. Um, and um, in the beginning of the book, I, I talk about uh, you know, realizing that um, you know, a, friend, a friend of mine, I, I was sitting around having dinner with some Chinese friends and talking about a book by uh, Timothy Garton Ash um, about East Germany when the wall came down and everybody could see their, their Stasi files for the first time and found out who'd been spying on them and their friends, their family, and so on. Uh, and um, I, I kind of began to realize that in China, when, when that day comes, people might not actually end up having that same rel relevatory moment even if they do see their files because what their files are going to consist of are going to be email transcripts and cell phone text messaging records and cell phone tower records and you know their chat 
messages and, and you know, the key loggers that was installed by viruses on their computers and this kind of thing. And, and it's, it's a very different type of world. Um, and there's another uh, yeah. term you coin in the book, uh, Facebookistan, which mm -hmm. I think uh, resonates. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, actually, in fairness, uh, Facebookistan and Google Dumb is uh, <laughs> the title of a chapter. And uh, it, the chapter opens with a, um, a Hong Kong scholar who is talking to you in a similar kind of environment. And, and he says, um, he likens Facebook to a country. This is to speak to your observations about this complicated sovereignty. He says, allow me to make a wild analogy, one I believe is not entirely out of left field. Many people know that there's censorship in China. Many people also tell me, one, the poor Chinese must feel really repressed, or two, they must be all right with it. But um, uh, ask yourself this, if I decide not to leave Facebook, yet I know they do not care at all about my privacy, what does that mean? How is that different from the people who continue to use the internet in China day in and day out, despite the prevalent and prolific practices of censorship? That is, surveillance is as um, uh, pernicious as censorship, he's, mm -hmm. he's saying. And, and it does uh, take us to this set of questions about privacy, which I just wanted you to expound mm -hmm. on a little bit. Um, I, I'm not a constitutional lawyer or a rights lawyer, but I have the impression that our struggle to define mm -hmm. a privacy right is less mature than our conviction about our rights to free expression and belief. Mm -hmm. and, and what do you, how would you define the struggle for privacy in political spaces on the internet today? Right. Well, you know, I mean, there's there's a lot of people in this country, particularly, who like to write, you know, privacy is dead, get over it. Um, and, you know, and, and it is hard to define, and we do make a lot of trade-offs just in order to use certain services and have conveniences, we're handing over um, certain privacy. But I, I think in a human rights and political context, um, it really comes down to uh, can dissent be possible? And what level of privacy and freedom from pervasive surveillance do you need in order for dissent to be possible, in order for peaceful opposition to be possible, in order for unpopular speech to be possible, you know, just people with unpopular ideas. I mean, one of the, the founding ideas of this country was that um, to avoid tyranny of majority, and to enable that we have a system where somebody who has a highly unpopular idea has an opportunity to advocate that idea so that it may become perhaps a popular idea someday. Or that if, if a, um, only a small minority of people think a particular law is unjust, that they have an opportunity to advocate for the overturning of that law. And so if we completely lose privacy, if everything's completely out in the open, what kind of society do we end up, ha are, are we going to end up having a, a tyranny of the majority? And, and, and it's not just for political dissent, of course. And, and one of the examples I use in the book, you know, within the United States is a, a, a woman who was fleeing an abusive husband and didn't want, you know, she was trying to use the internet to create a support network for herself, but she didn't want her husband finding out who her online contacts were. And when Google Buzz kind of changed, you know, suddenly appeared, you know, in her, in the middle of her Gmail and her Google reader, that suddenly exposed her privacy in ways that she felt was very dangerous. And you can say, you know, ultimately that's a political issue too, because if people can't speak out, if people don't feel safe to speak out about problems of abuse and, and, and problems of vulnerability, um, that's going to, that's marginalizing people not only socially and endangering them, but, but also kind of excluding a segment of people from the political discourse, you know, or people who don't want their boss to know their sexual orientation, or people who don't want their employer to know their political preferences. Um, and, and so, uh, I, I guess the bottom line is um, that as we're navigating this, and, and obviously people are giving up a lot more information, and there, there are many people who write very eloquently about the, the, the importance and all the benefits of openness and sharing, and I, you know, there, there, 
people have a right to be open and share and, and they're you know open government and so on. But if if there are if there's no option and no ability to be private or to be anonymous or pseudonymous in a manner that enables min sort of minority voices and vulnerable groups to have a space in our social discourse, we've lost. Yeah. Well, that's, in, I mean, that's really impressive and articulate. And no doubt you thought about this a lot more deeply than, than um, almost all of us here, if not all of us. And I, I wonder then, do you believe that the solutions, this paradigm of opt-in, credible opt-in systems and credible um, ability to become anonymous or not mm -hmm. as an individual chooses, are those pathways of solutions equally applicable in authoritarian or totalitarian countries and in free ones? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, a, a very good question. Um, it, you know, I, I guess in um, free countries, you know, you have fewer people who are worried about kind of anonymity. Um, but uh, I, I, think, I think it is equally important that people be able to choose whether they want to have an online identity tied to their national ID card, passport identity, or whether they want to have an online identity that is separate in some way. Um, and you know, right now the problem is is that how how do you create those systems? You know, um, and Google is actually with Google Plus. They're now wrestling after being pressured by their users, um, who many of whom were not happy that they were requiring real names, and now they're trying to adjust it so that they can allow people to use you know what you would call a persistent pseudonym. You know, a, a, a pen name that kind of has a track record behind it mm -hmm. of credibility. Um, and you know, who becomes the identity broker and who is trusted? You know, it's, it's a tough question. But what's happening as a default, in a way, is that a lot of websites, um, because, it, you know, like a, a lot of news websites or, or kind of online community websites that don't have a lot of infrastructure to kind of manage who's logging in and, you know, it, they're trying to avoid spam and trying to avoid harassment on the site. They just by default say, okay, you have to use your Facebook login to log into our site and to participate in the conversation on our site, or you have to use your Google login and so on. And then the individuals are kind of subject to whatever rules Facebook or Google or whoever right. is imposing, and those rules may not necessarily be appropriate or safe for, for a person in a particular country trying to engage in a particular conversation. But the problem is, is that, you know, they, these people don't, are, are not going to trust kind of a local identity broker either. Um, so it does become a difficult problem. Um, but, you know, one, one of the arguments that some people make um, and I, I think there may be some people in the room who can talk about this too, is, is that in online communities, you know, whether or not you're using your real name or not, it's questionable about whether that actually yeah, reduces yeah, hate yeah, speech yeah, right, or, or not. Right. So uh, you, you guys have been really patient, and I'd like to take one or two questions from the audience. And, but before I do that, as we finish up here, just one uh, last question. The last year has been a year of extraordinary uh, political change and turmoil in which the subject or the idea of internet uh, freedom has gone mainstream. Uh, Secretary of State has been struggling to define what it means or what government should do about it. Uh, governments like Sweden have been wrestling with this perhaps for a little bit longer, but we are here in Washington, D.C. Everything about your thesis makes me suspect that the State Department is not your lead agency for uh, constructing the ideal world that you're uh, thinking about. But what would your advice be to mm -hmm. the government of the United States with all of its baggage, with all of its mm -hmm. history? Um, what can the United States, beyond constructing 
an ideal regime at home as a mm -hmm. demonstration and as a refuge, right. what can it bring to the rest of the world? Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely, you know, practice what you preach and be consistent is, you know, but that's always, I mean, that's not a, we do that really that's well. not a new problem. That's, that's, <laughs> that's an old a, problem of right. our human rights policy and so on. And, and I certainly think that uh, it's better to have an internet freedom policy than not to have one, even if you don't always live up to it in all your different other policies. Um, but uh, I, I, would, I would say that b beyond sort of trying to serve as a model, um, I think one would be, and along with governments like Sweden and so on, to, to really try and bring together at least all democracies, you know, country, countries that are willing to make a commitment to internet freedom, to really talk about how do we balance as democratic societies these concerns of, yes, we need security. Yes, we need privacy. Yes, we need to protect children. Yes, you know, we need to g defend against cyber attack. Yes, we have intellectual property issues that are real. And we also have free expression, privacy, and civil liberties issues on the internet. And, and as, as democracies, we need to work this out together rather than in a piecemeal fashion. Because if you do it in a piecemeal fashion, then you end up having a, you know, a set of trade agreements that end, end up you know, being aimed at protecting intellectual property but kind of contradict the internet freedom agenda and things go very quickly awry and then the rest of the world who, are, who would really like to, are kind of depending on things working out, um, become very cynical and disappointed. So I, I, I think it's, it's important to kind of be committed uh, and, and coordinated to having that discourse. Um, and, and I think the other thing is to be really genuinely committed to multi-stakeholder engagement and that this is not something that governments can figure out alone. The internet was not created by governments, you know, with some government funding, but, it, you know, it's, it's coordinated, its critical resources are coordinated in a multi-stakeholder way, its standards are, are coordinated and decided by engineers. Um, and that I, I, I think, I mean, the whole point of democracy is you sort of give up a bit of control in order to gain legitimacy. And this is, in a way, sort of the next level of giving up a little control in order to gain greater legitimacy and in, in order to be a real leader um, is that sometimes you lead by enabling. And so the extent to which we can lead by enabling civil society to really step in and find solutions that are perhaps best constructed by civil society and enabling and in, encouraging and sometimes kind of prodding uh, industry to, to not only innovate but to care about civil liberties and, and human rights so that they don't have to be regulated because they'll already be doing the right thing. You know, I mean, that would be the ideal and thing. The so, so really to, to enable um, rather than to try to do anything, everything themselves as governments, I think, would be a, a good way right. to go. Can I invite one or two questions? Sure. I'm curious, have you noticed any change or evolution in end-user license agreements for a lot of these online services? Mm -hmm. uh, well, they change kind of every day. <laughs> 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 and, um, you know, they're, they're, there's actually a couple of websites. Somebody runs kind of a feed of, you know, every time a major Internet service or platform changes their any of their terms of service or end-user license agreement, they kind of, you know, ping this feed and it's kind of active every day um, and and so you know this is the thing is you sign a user license agreement and you know part of the terms are that this can change at any time and you recognize that <laughs> you know um, so yeah things I mean Facebook is constantly changing its terms of service and so, so are all of them Google just changed its privacy policies very dramatically and anybody who uses who has a Google account has gotten emails and pop-ups and messages about it. Um, so yeah, people, there, there is an effort among a number of companies to try and simplify them and be more upfront and you know, inform people of changes. So for instance, Google with all its notifications is, is kind of uh, one effort not to be sneaky about it at least. <laughs> um, and, uh, but yeah, they, they do change a lot. Um, and 
you know, the extent to which they are changed as a result of people kind of pushing and the extent to which they are changed as a result of lawyers, you know, thinking that it would be a good idea or marketing people, you know, it's a big combination. Anyone else? One or two others? Yes, one, I see one hand uh, right there, reasonably near the microphone, and one over there. I wonder if you have any thoughts about third-party storage, data storage mm -hmm. situations like in the, in the mega uploads uh, situation, where um, mega upload based mm -hmm. in Hong Kong has two storage companies here, people who may have legitimately used mega upload for their own data find themselves yeah. having their data storage in the third party who's told by the U.S. Attorney General, oh yeah, you can, you can start deleting this data. By the way, they are not gonna delete it. But uh -huh. the U.S. Attorney's Office said, yes, you could start deleting this data. And the, these companies are, it's legal. Yeah. They can, it's up to them. They can delete it uh -huh. if they want. Yeah. Do you have any? Yeah, well, th I mean, this is, a, this is a big problem, you know, with the, this is kind of what, what is known as the cloud computing problem. Um, <laughs> Uh, which is is that you know our websites, our data, our email, you know everything is increasingly stored uh, on these third-party services, and they can suspend your account, your account for you know if you violate the terms of service, they can suspend your account, or they can suspend your account if you know uh, there's sort of some legally binding request that they have to do so, and 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 so on. So, yeah, it's. We, you know, I think the lesson of the mega upload case was just for people who are not familiar with it. It's it's kind of one of these sites where you can you can store large files and share them with people and and uh, use it as backup storage or also use it to transfer files without having to email them. And and so a lot of people were using it to share music and movies illegally, but also a lot of other people. We're using it, and I use another service that's very similar, just to store a lot of documents or store a lot of your own photos or you know whatever it is that you want to store. Um, and businesses depend increasingly, particularly small businesses, depend on these websites to to share information with people in different locations. And then you know a bunch of people were using it for illegal file sharing. The U.S. government went after the site. It's been closed down. They're they're prosecuting the. The, the, the people who run the site, and yeah, so the, the legitimate users are, are kind of up a creek, potentially, except that it sounds like they'll have a way to get their data out because the people who run it are, I guess, making an effort. But, but you're kind of at the mercy of the goodwill of, of the people who run the website at the end of the day, and this is kind of what I you know, refer to as sort of the unaccountable sovereignty. You know. and, and so, for instance, with Amazon web hosting, you know, um, their terms of service uh, stipulate that they can suspend your account for any reason. And so when Joe Lieberman got exercised that Amazon was hosting WikiLeaks, you know, they, they dropped WikiLeaks even though WikiLeaks had not been charged with anything and um, you know, there was no need to actually explain why they were dropping WikiLeaks. And that's a more controversial example, but it's, it's, an, it's another kind of famous example of how um, these websites, they operate within a, you know, kind of jurisdictional environment of many, com of many countries, but they also have their own private jurisdictions in which their own private law is much more narrow and much more ar arbitrary than the law and the checks and balances and the, and the due process of actual nations. So one last question, and then we'll let you get back to your wine and, uh, um, There'd be plenty of time to ask questions one-on-one -on -one with Rebecca. I'm Mike Nelson at Georgetown University, and I am a technologist. I'm not a lawyer or a political scientist, but I'm very grateful for people like you who try to bridge the two cultures, people like Larry Lessig as well. Most people who aren't technologists don't realize that the networks as they exist today really aren't built to protect privacy or to protect freedom of speech, and, and if they were, that'd be very different, that would have encryption built in, you'd have something like Tor or PGP that would ensure that anything I sent was really unreadable. There would be proxy servers like hidemyass.com <laughs> to ensure that no one knows where I'm coming from and there'd be anonymity built in. 
Do you think any major ISP is going to go that route and offer something like that? Why don't you think that's happened yet? Mm -hmm. And do you think there's any chance that in the future we'll have the kind of human rights network that would have all those features built in? Well, maybe in Sweden somebody will do that. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. Um, that would be great. Um, I, I, I think, you know, the problem is now companies are, are facing a lot of pressure from their home governments not to do that. Um, and so it becomes very difficult to actually operate a business and survive as a business and, and have all those features. But uh, it would be wonderful if people could keep trying. All right. Well, thank you all for standing still and asking such good questions. Thank you again, Ambassador. The book is Consent of the Network. Party on. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.